At the birth of Jesus, frankincense, gold, and myrrh were brought in honor of him, in honor of his birth. And here in our, our text this morning, as we're looking in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, where Jesus is an honored guest at Bethany, here close to the end of his walk on earth, precious ointment was poured out in honor of him. Now I want to set some possible parallels and 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 perhaps parallels that, that are not, uh, don't seem to be parallels, uh, aside first before we get into our, our text. This scene here in John chapter 12 seems different than the anointing that appeared to be earlier in the Lord's ministry when he was invited into the home of a man uh, who was a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And we find this in Luke chapter 7 and verses 36 uh, to 50. And it is here where a woman came in who's described as sinful and Jesus ultimately forgives uh, her sins and has a discussion uh, about forgiveness uh, with, uh, and love with, with uh, Simon the Pharisee there. And though it has been debated as to whether or not John chapter 12 is a parallel with Matthew 26, and, and Mark 14. In Matthew 26, verse 6, and Mark 14, verse uh, 3, we have reference to Simon the leper, who is also noted in the text there as being in Bethany. And, and so it may be very possible, and it, to me it seems quite possible, that it is a parallel uh, passage here. And perhaps uh, Simon the leper is, is one who was a neighbor of Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus. And, and here, Jesus uh, being an, an invited guest, and, and Lazarus is also described as, as reclining at, at table uh, there, that that's where this dinner has, has taken place. And we find that Mary is not named by Matthew and Mark. But keep in mind, those were, Gospels were written much earlier than John's Gospel was. John's Gospel written uh, much later as he lived much longer uh, than the other, other apostles. And, and so it, uh, Mary may not have been named in, in Matthew and Mark out of protection for her. Because keep in mind, according to John's gospel, Lazarus's life also is ultimately threatened because of, of him, many were putting their faith in, in Jesus because they knew that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And, and so just keep that, that in, in, in mind. And now let's, let's get into the text here of John 12 and verses one through eight. As we have this return uh, to Bethany, John chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. And so the Lord's hour was, was drawing near. This is six days before the Passover. The Passover began the 14th day of Abed or Nisan, uh, first month of the Jewish sacred calendar. You know, three years of Jesus's public ministry were being brought to fruition. And so much Jesus had done, so much Jesus had said. However, his greatest work was soon to be accomplished as he would go to the cross and die for our sins there. But Jesus is here a distinguished guest among them. With the Passover soon to come, there, there would not be enough room in Jerusalem for all the people to stay who would be coming to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And that would mean that in all the towns and villages around Jerusalem, uh, people would be finding lodging in, in people's homes and so we can see that this is possibly providing this great opportunity as people are coming to Jerusalem, and especially people who had heard of what Jesus had done, to be here in the home uh, where Jesus is also being honored, where, where Jesus is being uh, served. <clears throat> and so we have him in a humble home in Bethany, and Jesus it's a remarkable how at times he seems to draw attention to what others would think is insignificant or, or to the, the small places. But Bethany became special. 
uh, notoriety for the raising of Lazarus. This would also be the place from where Jesus would ascend back up into heaven, according to Luke 24 and verse 50. And just imagine if there was a tour guide in that, that area uh, following these, these events and, and could have pointed and, you know, Lazarus was raised from, from there and Jesus ascended from over there in Bethany. But Martha is again found serving. It, it seems to be her gift, serving and helping, whether it was in her home or if it was in the home of, of Simon the, letter, uh, the, the, the leper. You know, perhaps it is what she did wherever she was. You know, two things worth considering in this scene as we continue to look through it are the generosity in giving, but also the problem posed by the love of money as we will ultimately see. And verses three through six then we find the generous gift that was bestowed upon Jesus from the hands of Mary. As it says, verse three, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And so again, Here's Mary at Jesus' feet where earlier she had sat as she had listened to his teaching while Martha had been busy serving as we noted in Luke chapter 10 and verses 38 to 39 as she sat, Mary sat at Jesus' feet, the Lord's feet, listening to his teaching. And here is her gift, something of great value. And as the text here notes, and also Mark 14, 10, it could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. And a denarii was a day's wage. And so we can see how costly this was. She didn't offer a, a common gift. It wasn't one that cost her little or cost her nothing. This may have been perhaps the most precious thing that she owned. Someone has said, a loving heart judges no offering too precious for Christ. You know, she may have done this with a tear in her eye, wishing that she had even a greater gift to give. But she reveals through her act the great esteem that she had for Jesus. You know, consider uh, giving Jesus some, uh, anything that equaled about a year's wages. But it was prompted, this gift was prompted by loving gratitude. She was grateful, deeply grateful to him. Words of wisdom and comfort and guidance had been received from Jesus at the death of Lazarus. And then her brother had been given back to her and to her sister Martha as Jesus raised him from the dead. So much for which to be grateful to, to the Lord. It has been said, love is, is not love if it, is ni if it nicely calculates the cost. Love gives its all, and love's only regret is that it has not still more to give. She loved, she was gra grateful, and she gave. And it was humbly administered. Both uh, Matthew 26, 7 and Mark 14, 3 refer to uh, the ointment being poured on his head. Anointing of the head was a common courtesy. Mary's act, as John recorded it, was an extraordinary act of bestowing love uh, to Jesus. Both the head and the feet and also other exposed parts of the body could have been uh, anointed. The reference to preparation for burial in, in verse 8 uh, may uh, hint at, at that or may imply that. But here again, at Jesus' feet, humbly offering her gift and wiping his feet with her hair. She let down her hair, something that Jew was, would have been unusual for a Jewish woman, especially in public. And yet she let down her hair and she wiped his feet. And how sweet it was, as the text tells us, the fragrance filled the house. Her act of generosity, what she was doing, 
uh, got the attention of everyone that was there, though her focus seems to have been primarily upon her Lord rather than focusing on what others might be thinking or doing. But in the eyes of Judas, we, we see how he viewed this act in John 12, 4 to 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. Judas saw that this could have served a better use in, in his mind. His objection was cloaked in concern for the poor, but there was no uh, true benevolent spirit here. Yes, much good could have been done with the money that the ointment was worth, but the inspired text here reveals his true character. It, it seems that a common purse was kept by the twelve. And here we have self-interest rather than interest of others being exposed in Judas. How common the tendency to devalue a generous gift because of envy or selfishness. You know, we see that going on even in the world uh, today uh, of those who, who can't be grateful and rejoice with others in, in what they are, are doing. Uh, the poor that he may have had in mind, with, that he may have truly had it in mind was poor Judas. Judas could have gotten some benefit out of that money. But the, bet the betrayer here is noted as being a thief. He helped himself to the funds that he carried. And we might wonder, well, did Jesus not know? We see that Jesus left Judas not untrusted, but with a trust. And it was up to Judas what became of him, but became of himself and his actions. The trust provided Judas opportunity to do that which was right and to do that was, was good. As, as perhaps a side note here, consider those in a position of responsibility need to remain on guard. Someone has said that office or position tests, forms, and reveals character. The bag is a tree of life or death to all who have to do with it. How many can trace their ruin to a bag? Judas can do so. The bag was the greatest thief, but Judas was the responsible one. You, you see, the, the bag stole his heart. It drew his attention that was there. And yet this act of, of love that he witnessed ripened and revealed Judas's true character, and it surfaced here. Judas's love for money may have been what really led him to betray Jesus. It seems that Jesus, or it seems that Judas may have valued the ointment more than he valued even the master. That really seems to be conveyed in his betrayal, though he was extremely sorrowful at the end when he realized to what end his actions led in the death of, of his Lord. And he went very sorrowfully and he ended uh, his life. And so here's the perfume worth a year, about a year's wages, uh, 300 denarii. And the master to him was worth 30 pieces of silver. That's what he accepted to fulfill his role of betraying the Lord. Let us be mindful in our own lives that temptation can come to us based on our own inward desires even in doing what we are fitted for doing. Let us remain on guard lest what we do well ultimately becomes our undoing because it becomes approached by selfish interests rather than glorifying and honoring the Lord. On John 12, 7 to 8, we find the Lord's acceptance of the gift and it's great contrast to the view of Judas. As we read, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do, you 
do not always have me. Jesus stepped forward and he spoke on her defense. You'll leave her alone. Uh, any attempts by Mary to vindicate herself is not contained in any of the accounts. She just quietly did what she did. Her focus rested solely on the Lord without concern of perspectives of others. Jesus took his stance between innocence and a slanderous tongue. Jesus took his stance between love and cold indignation in the view toward her. Someone has said that benevolence is often too timid to defend itself, but it is bold enough to break the box of ointment. Let it do this, and Jesus will ultimately and successfully defend it. But here is a looking ahead toward his burial. The quickness of Jesus' burial following his death on the cross would not provide the opportunity for such attention as at this very moment. Jesus' words added that deeper meaning to her loving actions that even were going through the mind of Mary, more than she was even conscious of. Judas virtually accused Mary of robbing the poor, so Jesus came forward in her defense and complimented her in regard to preparation for his death and his burial. You know, there are acts that, that we may be engaged in that have much greater significance than we even realize at the time. We needed to just step forward and, and serve and do and, and, and all to the glory of God. And in time, we might see, but, but approach things from the standpoint that realize that only God knows the full extent to which those things may play out. We see this in Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25, 37 to 40, and one of his focuses on the judgment and, and being called to account, where we read, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Is this our consciousness as we go about life and as we engage in, in actions of service, that, that even in, in serving the needs of others, that we are truly glorifying God? We're fulfilling what our Lord has asked us to do, and, and in a sense, we are doing it unto him. Jesus' defense clearly implied acceptance of her gift. It was acceptable and it was good. It was seen as a tribute of sincere love and deep affection. His genu her genuineness and sin sincerity were acknowledged. She had this opportunity presently. It would not come later. There would be other opportunities for helping the poor, however. But this is what she did for the Lord. And the act was a momentous one. In Matthew 26, 13, and in Mark 14, verse 9, we have the identical statements that are made there uh, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whenever, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Three gospels record this account. That in itself implies significance to what was going on. And here we are this morning talking about that event that took place. Talking again about Mary and the anointing of Jesus. And as we embrace the gospel and the good news of, of Jesus, we are continuing to tell the story of Mary as part of that story. Let us acknowledge Genuine offerings are not a waste. Our giving in love and sincerity and devotion to Christ or needs done in his name will not be rejected by him, but acknowledged uh, by him. Uh, Jesus even talks about the, the reward of even giving a cup of cold water in his name. 
Opposition and questioning may come as we engage in actions of service. Those who give self-sacrificingly to Jesus and his cause will probably face opposition or even questioning of, of motives. And so we do need to keep our, our motives pure. And it is true that our giving is between us and God, but we need to encourage each other to, to consider how much we have been blessed and let that feed our generosity toward others in, in meeting the needs of others. We can afford the objection of others if we have Jesus's approval. And so above all, seek to honor him, seek his glory, seek his praise. We may even be taken advantage of in our giving, but let God receive the glory. Still give generously and give cheerfully. And then also let us remember, we do not know others' hearts. Let us be careful of our judgment of the gifts of others. You know, we need to keep that in mind lest we question the gift of others, whether it's big or, or small. And consider, could a gift be questioned because we have envy in our own heart? Recognize both the privilege and the responsibility that is ours to give. So, as we consider that perfume, the fragrance of it filling the house, how fragrant is our offering? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18, as Paul was acknowledging his gratitude and appreciation for gifts that Christians at Ephesus had bestowed on, on his behalf, he says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Our gifts of support can have that sweet fragrance. They can be a fragrant offering when they are duly given and they're given with the right motives and, and therefore they are a sacrifice that is acceptable and it is pleasing uh, to God. Is the aroma of our gifts, of our service out there are around us? Not that we're trying to draw attention to ourselves, but that we're just out there doing and that sweetness is being seen by the world, especially in our service with one another, but even beyond the sphere of our fellowship uh, to meeting the needs of doing good unto to all. But how about our very lives? Paul, writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 16, he says, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Well, as we surrender our life to the Lord, he makes us sufficient in this role. How do we smell? What is the fragrance of our life? Yes, we may not smell the same to all people. For those who reject Christ and those who reject the truth, we may be the smell of death. But for those who have accepted Christ, for those who believe in, in him, for those whom he is also their Lord, we may smell very sweet. What is the aroma of our life? As we give our life in, in service, first and foremost, may it be a sweet aroma to the Lord. And then also as we engage together, may it be a sweet aroma to one another as we sweetly join together in serving and honoring the Lord as his people.